All right, let me just make sure that that's all right. Hello, my name is Rowan Remy, and I made Entity Containment. Now, Entity Containment is an indie horror game, and it's a passion project of mine that I've been wanting to work on for a while and have kind of like dabbled in in a few of my classes, but was really able to um, work on and bring in to fruition for Capstone. But let's start off with um, what inspired me to make an indie horror. So the evolution of the indie horror genre. It started out, I like to think, in about 2012 with SCP Containment Breach, which is a horror game about a science facility where the monsters inside have already escaped and you're just trying to survive. Um, a couple other games that came out in this time period were Amnesia, The Dark Descent, and Slenderman, The Eight Pages. And these three games really kicked off the whole indie horror genre and really brought it to the public eye of a fun um, genre to play in. And then it kind of evolved. And nowadays we have what I like to call cutesy horror, where starting with Five Nights at Freddy's in 2014, this, um, this game brought to to the genre a, a sense of taking things that are adorable and making them creepy. And it kicked off and it has like six, six or seven games now, um, as well as inspiring other games like Bendy and the Ink Machine, Tattletale, and Hello Neighbor. And these are all games that take the cute aspects of like toys or um, cartoons and make them scary. And I, I really enjoy these kinds of games. So I wanted to try and make one myself. Um, but it's a messy process trying to focus on idea. So I had to do a lot of sketching. I had to like write everything down and really decide what I wanted to do. But once I figured that out, I was able to start my capstone. So that brings me to my first demo, Anomalous Containment. This is where I wanted to start on the um, creatures that the player would be able to interact with in the game. Um, I wanted to do their behaviors, their models, their animation, everything that brings them to life. So I found a design online and I bought it and I modeled it in Maya, which is a 3D modeling program. And then I colored and textured it in um, Photoshop, which is an art program. Um, and you can see like the, the bottom photo is of its skeleton, like its bones that just kind of make it. And the top photo is me testing out the way that its skin kind of moves as I um, manipulate those bones. And I called this little guy the para bear because he's got a parasitic bow that is possessing a teddy bear. Um, <laughs> And then we had to bring it to life. So I started out with some basic animations, just an idle animation you see there. Um, and then I made it follow the player around. So it kind of just at its own pace, just walks up and follows the player wherever the player goes. And I did this in Unity and C Sharp for the um, behaviors, um, as well as using Unity's um, animator. I know a lot of people animate in Maya, but I, I prefer to animate directly in Unity so I can see how everything's gonna look when it's done. Um, so now that we have a entity, we have to have some place to put it. So I started on my second demo, which was a facility. And I really wanted to focus on what, what's called non-Euclidean level design. Um, and I think I need to explain what non-Euclidean means. So there is a philosopher and a mathematician named Euclid. And he basically, in summary, said that if there are two parallel lines or if two lines are not parallel, then they're going to cross at some point. If they're parallel, then they'll never cross. But video games don't have to apply to normal laws of physics. For example, Portal and Portal 2 by um, Valve Corporations basically created a game where that doesn't have to be true. By using portals and placing them around the world, you can go from one place to another without actually traversing that distance. And so I tried to emulate that in my game. Um, and I made it with shaders. Shaders are what tell the computer what to print out and draw on the screen for the player. So I started out with a red and a green world. And by using two cameras, one camera for the player and one camera for the player would be in the other world, I had them mimic the motions of each other. And by using the shader to cut it out like a window, I was able to create this kind of seamless um, seamless window and door into the other world where the player can walk back and forth. And once I got that working in the test demo, I wanted to try putting it into an actual level and to see how confusing that might actually be for a player. 
So here I created a test facility and we can see the player goes up one hallway and ends up coming back down the other hallway without even turning around or turning left or right. They just come back the other way. And that's a lot of fun if you're trying to make a kind of spooky level design that things just don't quite work out in the player's headspace. And once I had those two down, I was able to put them all together in my third demo, which was the final game, Entity Containment. And this one I really wanted to focus on what it's like to play in a world like this. So I made a couple more models, I made one more entity, I made a whole bunch of science props to throw in there just to kind of set the scene. Um, and again, that was with Maya and Photoshop. And then I focused on some gameplay. I made it so that you can pick up things in the world and I made an entire facility. Um, I copied the um, hallway from the other facility and that's all the way at the top. I also added another non-Euclidean system down at the door. If you walk out the exit, you come right back in. <laughs> Um, and I did that again in Unity and C Sharp and with Visual Studio for the code. Um, so now I would like to show you the video of the game, if it'll have some audio. Oh no, don't do this. Is that gonna... Are you hooked up to HDMI? I am. So, so Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have to switch that speaker. Uh, yeah. external speakers. Okay. Oh, I don't think a hundred is what we want. <laughs> All right. There's nothing. Back what? Uh, just uh, get this out of full screen. Your video. Oops. Okay. Cool. Okay. It's. I won't let it. Try it again. Okay. Let's play it now. There's no audio. Um, if you can get your computer's uh, volume, yeah, right there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's get back into, there we go. And so looking back on the presentation, um, or presentation, project, um, 
One of my biggest issues I had while making this game was my frame rate. Um, so frame rate is basically like a, a film. How many pictures are you going to see per second? Um, normally for a video game, you want it to be anywhere between 30 to 60, depending on the quality of your game. Um, mine was running at about six frames a second while I was making it, which is not great. Um, and I found out that was um, because of another issue, which I, like, it took me a while to figure out what the issue was. But once I did, I found out that it was because of the lighting. Um, I had never had to work with lighting very much in, um, in Unity. Normally when you make a game, you just have like one sun and then you can throw in a couple like um, little, little smaller lights like around the map. But in this one, I had to light up every single room and I realized that with that many lights, there were about 25 to 30 different lights in my scene. Um, it really caused a lot of lag to the point where I couldn't even work on my game because it was lagging my computer, not just the game. Um, but once I figured that out, um, my, my solution was to replace all the lights with glowing boxes and it ended up working. And the boxes actually looked a lot like fluorescent lights that worked out anyways. Um, I was able to actually continue working on the game. And I learned a couple new things. I learned about um, a few things that were integrated into Unity that I hadn't actually known were there before. For example, the, the Unity state machine, which is how I was able to do the behaviors for each of the creatures, whether or not they were hungry or were looking at the player or wanted to escape, I had the Unity state machine manage all of that. And that was a lot of fun to work with. As well as the new Unity input system, there's not a whole lot of documentation on that. So I kind of had to teach myself how to work with it um, because I wanted my game to to be able to use not just keyboard and mouse as I wanted it to, to also be able to use controller. Um, but I think my game turned out really well. I love the way it looked. It's pretty much exactly how I envisioned it when I started. And I'm, I'm really happy about it. So in the future, um, there's a couple more bugs I want to work out. Sometimes the portals don't always work. Sometimes you can walk right through them. Um, there's also some issues with um, being able to be pushed through walls. If, uh, if one of the entities gets too close to you and tries to walk towards you, you can just get pushed straight through a wall. <laughs> I'd also like to work on some additional content. I made two more monsters that you didn't get to see in the video. Um, and I'd love to be able to finish them up, give them all their behaviors, and put them in the game as well. Um, and I want to release the game on Steam. Because, like maybe as a, a pre-release or as a demo, um, I, I want to get this out there for people to play and to give me feedback on it. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Yes. Uh, did you start this project? Did you kind of choose it because of your artistic abilities, or was that something that you developed while? Um, I'm already a really artistic person. I wanted to be able to make um, all the assets in the game. I wanted to basically make it from the ground up. So, um, yeah, I, I do enjoy modeling and doing all the art. Yeah. Um, one question I, uh, well, one quick question. Um, uh, why, why video over a live demo of the game? Um, particularly because the way I made the game, it's about exploration. Um, and being able to f get a feel for the world. So the monsters don't actually appear to like five minutes in. Um, not, that, not that long, more like a minute or two. It takes about five minutes to actually get to that um, uh, escape point. And that's to give the player time to look around and experiment and test out things in the world. Um, cool, that maybe answers my, my next question, which is what's the, um, what's the player's like primary action or mechanic for interacting, for like playing the game? What do you do? Um, yeah, it's supposed to be a very tangible world. Um, I started this with the idea of maybe one day it could be in VR. I don't see that being something I do personally. I'm not really big on um, producing for VR, but maybe eventually it could be converted into it. So the fact that you can pick up everything and experiment with things and like press buttons in the world, that was, that's really um, how I wanted the feel of the game to come across. Um, so you started off talking about <coughs> kind of giving us the context for horror games and the particular like subset of horror games that you wanted to build on. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm, I'm curious from a 
user standpoint, what mechanic or aspect of the game do you feel is the most horror? And, and I'm curious if you could tell us like why that is the thing that produces that feeling in the player. I think it's the atmosphere of the game. Um, it's unsettling. Um, there's like seeing like the um, the rainy day kid, which is the one in the yellow jacket. Um, it has a lot of like ink and very. Um, I don't know if people are uncomfortable with the word moist. <laughs> it, it's kind of like playing on those things, things that are just like slightly in the uncanny valley. The fact that the map doesn't work always at the top. You're supposed to walk all the way around, but you just walk up one way and come back the other. It's just all those little unsettling things that will tell your brain something's wrong and you're going to have to figure that out. How, do you, how did you communicate to the player that something's off in a way that doesn't come across as if there's a bug in the game? So I have a lot of, um, like, I, I wasn't able to really show this in the presentation, but there's, um, there's like whiteboards that the scientists of this facility have written on, and there is a map that you can actually see is drawn out, like they're trying to figure out why it is this way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you love indie horror games, you're very well versed in them. Was there something that you felt they're lacking that you wanted to include in the game as a differentiator? Or? Yeah, um, that's actually kind of one of the things that inspired me to make this game. Um, I like monsters that aren't particularly evil. Um, and you can kind of see that with mine. Like, they're just trying to escape. They're just little weird creatures that are just creatures. They aren't so much, like, malicious in any specific way. And I feel like a lot of horror has monsters that are malicious. And, like, yeah, that creates this sense of fear. And I wasn't going so much for fear as unsettling. Um, and sorry if I'm... Did you have a question? I was going to ask if there's, like, any danger or, like, anything damage? Or is everything... Not yet, but I was going to have some, uh, I was going to possibly imply that you yourself was also a monster. Um, but you can't like die. The, the facility will blow up. No. Not yet, but that is a possibility in the future. I was going to uh, maybe a question about the, the choice of music. Um, it sounded kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> like a, a rave going yeah. it's like Instead of unsettling, so I don't know if you want to make like darker tones. Maybe that was just for the video. The okay. the game doesn't really have music. Okay. Are there, there are sound effects. Like um. Creaking doors. Or mm -hmm. um, would it be possible to show us maybe one of the state machines or some of the code that controls the behavior of one of your entities? I I could. If it if it's too, uh, yeah. If it's not quick to do, don't worry about it. Um, we can see how quickly Unity wants to load okay, up. Cool. Um, no I'll, worries if it doesn't get them. I'll keep taking questions then while you while I. <laughs> Anyone else have? Uh, we saw that the terror bear just kind of follows around the player, but what does the rainy day kid do? Um, so you saw when the player walked in, it opened its umbrella. It hides. It it doesn't like being looked at. Each of these um, creatures has like specific um, specific requirements that you have to do to keep them contained. The pear bear gets hungry, you have to feed it. Um, the rainy day kid doesn't like um, being looked at. <laughs> so if every once in a while you just walk in and check on the rainy day kid, um, he'll not escape. I will if it loads up. <laughs> What did I enjoy most? Um, bringing these creatures to life and creating their kind of personalities around them, as well as also the scientists inside of the world. I, I like the fact that everything has its own personality. Even inside of the world, there's, um, I, I mentioned there being whiteboards, there's um, sticky notes and stuff. And each one of these, there's um, handwriting on that you can read and learn about the world and the people who live in it. Um, all right, so you asked me to show you the state machine. Um, so if I go to, I'll be in my prefabs. Entities, pair bear. 
So this is the um, pair bear's behaviors right there. Um, basically, it's got a couple different things. If it sees one of those toys, it'll walk towards it. Um, if it sees the player, it'll walk towards the player. Unless it's already seen one of the toys, it'll try to go towards the toys. Um, it will try and break out, but if it's in the middle of breaking out, you can bring it one of the um, little stuffed toys and it'll go after that instead. But if it has already broken out and it is already in the middle of escaping, um, you saw in the video, it wrapped its um, scarf around its eyes, it cannot see them. You cannot distract it from breaking out. Um, and you mentioned you wanted to see the um, other two. Get into there. Actually, this might be better if I just open up the build. Um, I did make a kind of bonus scene in my game right there where you can go and look at the, oh, that's, sorry. Yeah, I just gotta change the sensitivity real quick. It's, it's um, set up for a controller right now, so. Okay. Um, so here's another one, not a carpet. Um, that guy right there. He's got a couple in animations, but that's the only animation I was able to give him. Again, I, I didn't have time to finish all the behaviors. Um, and then there's this one over here. This is the original one. This is the first one I wanted to work with. Unfortunately, um, he was just a little bit too complex in what I wanted him to be able to do that I had to work with the pair bear instead. Um, but he's in here. Um, it depends, because I did kind of have like the three different things I focused on in my game. I had the um, entities, I had the world, and I had the um, polished gameplay. Um, I'd say, because the entities, the art side, and the technological side kind of go hand in hand, because it's a lot about, um, the, the animations kind of are the main feature about the entities. Um, but then also the behaviors are directly tied into their animations, and that's with the state machine. Um, but then the, um, the non-Euclidean systems, that wasn't like entirely tech. There was almost no, um, almost no aesthetic involved in that. Um, 